you know, or, uh, you know, someone's dead and we're going to figure out um, um, where that leads, you know. And the thing with Lynch and people like uh, Aronofsky is that they throw in a lot of uh, emotional engagement um, that is uh, different from that type of uh, um, emotional engagement, like Beauty and the Beast. It's a, it's a great story. Um, I was crying along with my kids, and, but, and I knew what happened because we know the story, but uh, um, Aronofsky brings in different types of emotional engagement and uh, more uh, um, um, an inquiring type of... Uh, it, it exercises my mind, I guess, a bit more, where Beauty and the Beast, they just sit back and, and let it play out for me. Um, whether I knew the ending or not, you know those types of, you know, Steven Spielberg's a perfect example. I mean, you're watching Lincoln, and you're also watching him point, <laughs> point you to saying, well, okay, now this is this is what's happening, and I'm making sure you don't miss this is what's happening. Um, he's he's that kind of guy. So, now one time I went to a, a Hall Walls art opening, and I I picked up the handout that was at the door when you walked in. And the first sentence said, this show utilizes gender as a powerful focusing agent for determining the assignment of meaning. <laughs> Does that type of language help or hurt the person who's trying to engage with the art? Um, again, I think it hurts um, before you've uh, engaged with the art. I think it's uh, useful after, hmm. um, and um, you know it could be useful to uh, um, help people who are baffled, and useful to help people who are engaged and just want uh, to go deeper. Do you ever think that some of the way that artists talk is meaningful? I mean, how would I put this? Some of it seems nonsensical to me. I'm wondering if you've come across that. <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of lectures. Um, I don't mind uh, uh, some artists writing because I tend to think it's uh, them, um, excuse me, uh, being um, more like their uh, 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 visual output. Um, but uh, and you'll find Lynch never really does any explaining of his work. He just lets it sit there. Um, I'm, I guess I'm more for. Uh, people that do that, you know, and I've seen a bunch of artist documentaries where really just a camera is following the artist around. Um, I like watching things get made. You know, mm -hmm. I think there was a beautiful uh, um, uh, piece on uh, um, uh, Kiefer. It was a beautiful piece on the guy that uh, put that rock sculpture um, at the uh, Los Angeles County Museum. Uh, there's a beautiful piece on um, Richter. Uh, putting together a show it was almost kind of pedestrian, but touching to watch him make his choices. And, you know, so those to me are also add-ons, but it does not replace the pure um, uh, singular engagement of being in front of a work of visual art. And I think that's uh, um, uh, sadly undervalued in our culture. So, but let me, let me ask uh, something of you in that same nature. Uh, 1976, uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, creative projects. Where do you fit into those? Uh, I don't know what that means. Like fit into it. Like, uh, what's your what? Uh, I mean, have you had several different roles? Do you see this as all one part of one thing? Huh. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> that's uh, that's very thought provoking. Do I see it as one thing? Um, it reminds me of something I heard once, that uh, there was a point in the history of the world where there were more books suddenly than you could read in your lifetime, if you spent the rest <laughs> of your life. And then the same thing happened with film. There became a point where there was more films than you could ever possibly see because you'll just run out of time. So the question is, is that if you look at film in terms of its entirety, it's incomprehensible because you cannot comprehend all of it. You'll never experience all of it. Okay. Isn't that sort of like what my output of my life is like in its entirety? Like, I mean, 
can it really be comprehended? <laughs> What's your answer to that? <laughs> well, I don't really, th I don't really think about such things. You know, I mean, uh, there's a song by Yoko Ono where she says, "Ask the lion why he's running so fast," and he says, "I don't know. I'm just doing it." You know. So yeah, I get, I get, and so you have a a, a beautiful um, answer as an artist that you're just doing what you're doing, man. And uh, um, some would think, oh, that's a, you know, that's a cop out. But I get exactly what you're saying. You're, you know, uh, you're. But the beauty is, uh, there's not many lions like you. You know, <laughs> there's lot. You could look at lots of lions and go, oh yeah, they all run fast. But lions don't have the consciousness to look around at other lions. And go, hey, look, we're lions and we're all running fast. Yeah. Um, there's not many. Uh, uh, folks that um, make a, you know a video a day or many videos nearly every day of their life for uh -huh. 40 years yeah um, so let's just step away from the uh, totality of it and yeah, let's look at specific things well, like the last time I engaged with you in a work of art was when I photographed you at Greg's birthday party okay so suppose you were to ask me like what was my purpose in doing that all right I mean Paula said it beautifully once. She said, we would ask you to be the best man at our wedding, but we know that you would like doing something, like photographing it a lot more. And I said, you're right, I would. I would, I would love that immense, considerably more. Uh, now, so I'm, I, I come up to you and I say, can I photograph you? And I did. Well, you actually held a card up that said that. Yeah, I did, I did. <laughs> I tried an experiment. Because I was at Nietzsche's over the winter, and the sound in the place was so oppressive, <laughs> there was no room for communication. So f to this event, I brought a, a piece of paper, I mean a pad of paper, and whenever somebody would come up to try to talk with me, I would say, write it down. And I've saved all these notes, and I'm, and I'm in the process of sending them to people. Look at what we talked about when we were at the event. Um, so, I had to photograph you too. Now, you could look at it two ways. That photograph was your opportunity as the subject of the photo to represent yourself to the world. And you must have liked it because you told me you did. <laughs> um, when you look at that photo then, there must be something in that photo that you like what you see. Maybe you interpret it as saying, uh, my relationship with this woman is going in a positive direction. I mean, there's so much that you could, you could, you could read into that photo. So I was telling people as I was pro putting out all the photos, I said, the best photos for me are the ones that when you look at them, you can make up a story in your head. And I said, here's, here's a photo and I'm gonna tell you the story. And I'm, I would make up a story that you can see in the photo. And I'd say, now what is your version of the story going, going on in that photo? And that ties into something you said earlier about uh, taking the things that you do in life, the commercial things, taking your artistic skills, such as storytelling, and incorporating them into that uh, activity. Do you recall when you said that? I earlier? do. I do, and I, I think it's. Uh, um, I, I'm a believer in that. Um, and uh, you know, we could go back. Uh, anthropologists will say, "Oh, well, our whole entire culture was built on uh, the uh, idea of story. That the our before there was writing, it was a uh, um, a verbalized." Uh, transference of information from person to person, um, generation to generation, um, and it was told in the form of a of a digestible, memor memorable piece of information. And uh, stories tend to be memorable. Bits of information tend to be less so. And here you are saying, "Oh, I'm I'm con conflating." 
um, this uh, this image, or actually, the the image is conflated. I'm expanding the image into a story now, and I can. And what I'm also hearing from you, which I think is uh, is beautiful, is that I'm seeing an entire story from this uh, uh, flat screen image. And what you know, what is that uh, more than just our imagination? And uh, why not apply your imagination um, whenever and wherever, as opposed to uh, well, I'm comfortable now, and I'm just looking at this beautiful picture. This is the best time to apply imagination. Um, you know, I come from uh, learning about uh, um, uh, of, of the idea of creativity that, that uh, pushes beyond artists and say that everybody has this same spark. They usually all have it when they're kids and it's drummed out of them, um, depending on the fields they all end up in. Um, but I'm saying that the, really the, um, the better time for imagination is not when you're comfortable, it's when you're in trouble. That's when you want to be freer and looser to have more imagination to get out of trouble. You know, there, well, let's not, we also have imagination when we're in trouble because, you know, if you're in trouble, you're, you're going to f- uh, fight or flight and, or you're coming up with a really unique solution. Um, I'd say before when you're headed towards trouble, that's when people start to get really nervous and less creative. And, and, and a bit uh, thinner in their choices. Um, and I tend to say that uh, you can always have broader choices if you're in the mindset of always taking action. If you're in the mindset that uh, when an unexpected, uh, unwanted situation comes, you remove the word unwanted from it and just say, I didn't expect this. Oh, and so now I'll do this instead of what I thought I was going to do. So you're, you're, in, you're in a more of a flow, the flow of your life, and people talk about that sense of flow mm. as, um, um, like, you're, you're in a state of flow now, I would speculate, making these shows. You're really good at it. it, it uh, I doubt you'd be doing it for 40 years if, uh, if it brought you excruciating anxieties and things like that. Some people live that way, but I don't sense that in you. Um, but uh, um, I say that if you can... Um, Find a sense of flow around um, um, the unexpected uh, things that happen in your life. Things to, things uh, tend to uh, fall in line a bit more easily. It's it, not magically, but uh, they do fall in line, and you're more apt to take those few extra actions. You know, oh, uh, oh, I I left. Uh, I forgot to put my. Uh, um, wash for, in the dryer, and I need those clothes tomorrow morning, but I'm tired. Well, uh, you know you want those clothes tomorrow morning, and you just push yourself. And you say, well, the unexpected was I forgot to put it in when I went down there to feed the cat, and I don't want to walk back down there again. The, the, uh, that's the unwanted. The unexpected is you didn't do it, so you just say, I'm going to go do it now anyway. And that's a minor situation, but... It, the more habits that that builds, um, around, then major situations become that much easier to deal with. So, uh, tell me, um, in the in the years you've you know you beyond the TV shows you've made films with people. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you see and what do you feel is uh, um, is an is a good representation of uh, creativity in action. What's creativity to you in the work that you've been part of and have seen? Hmm. Uh, well, number one, I think creativity <coughs> is brought about by example. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but when you're around a person who's creative, it can be contagious without them even encouraging you to do anything. Has that ever happened to you, where you've been around a creative person and suddenly you sort of catch their fire? Tony Conrad, <laughs> Mark Freeland. <laughs> I picked up the saxophone because of Mark Freeland, and uh-huh. I knew nothing about it. And uh, I was there honking on a stage, barely even able to get the sound by getting the reed against the uh, mouthpiece. And I came off, and people said, Wow, I didn't know you played the saxophone. And I never said, oh, I don't. 
I just said, oh, thanks. That's great. <laughs> In a year, I had a band. So I guess Mark Freeland. So tell me your experiences with that. Uh, well, I mean, I learned a lot in my years of working with Ron Emke about the, the whole thing about uh, what you described as uh, the unexpected, the unwanted, and your imagination in dealing with the unwanted. Uh, and, but I would look at it as playfulness. I, I, yeah. you know, I, I saw the uh, interaction between playfulness and creativity. And then there's another thing. Uh, it's the and this you just brought this up with the saxophone. Uh, lose your fear of coming across as stupid. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. Yes. If you have that fear, it's going to hold you back for a lot of things. Big time uh, uh, national, international uh, uh, business consultant, actually from Buffalo, Seth Godin. He was just in Buffalo yesterday said the exact same thing. If you want to get closer to success, you have to hold two thoughts in your head at the same time. That I'm trying something I haven't tried before and I may look stupid. You have to hold those two thoughts in your head and, st and still do it. So that means that um, one should not identify too much with their art. Because then when people criticize the art, you think they're criticizing you. Um, that, that's an interesting phrasing of it. Um, I don't see how you can't identify with your own art. I think artists are basically putting themselves out there. Um, I would say uh, perhaps the wording is uh, attach themselves to the product of your art. Uh, you know, that might be a little, maybe we're splitting hairs here, but uh, it, it's more of the, uh, um, you know, the event, like, you know, Aronofsky made a film that was kind of this bizarro sci-fi movie that I didn't really care much for. Um, or Lady Gaga is someone I used as an example. I mean, she made this uh, record that seemed to have crash-landed her, her music career, uh, art pop, uh, and... Uh, I don't think she was so attached to it that she didn't think twice about making a record with Tony Bennett. And it brought her back um, when people were reminded of what a great voice she really had. Um, you know, maybe she uh, got, you know, in my view, way too self-indulgent in that art pop with this point of view that she was living with. Um, and it got to where it was, uh, but she turned around and... Uh, uh, made a made a, a serious uh, um, a class record of classics with a, a great singer, and then she did a year of acting. She was on a TV show. Um, so uh, I don't think she was. I think she is a, very attached to uh, the art she wants people to see of her, um, but she's not attached to the product that it becomes when it comes out. Um, I don't think any. You know, I think any good artist that survives year after year after year. Um, um, releases it to the world as a gift. Uh, once it released, once you release your art and it becomes public. All right, I'm going to tell you uh, an actual uh, thing that I came across. Uh, Stanley Kubrick did a movie called The Shining. And so somebody got an idea to do a documentary on it where he got uh, six or seven film theorists. And he said, do your analysis of the film. Yep, 223. Yeah, room 223, right. And uh, they were all different. I mean, a lot of them saw things that, you know, when you, when you watch the documentary, you go, really, really, the carpet has that much significance <clears throat> in this scene? Uh, and somebody said this. He said, well, what you have to realize is those interpretations are part of the film, whether or not the director intended to put them in. Which is an interesting way of putting it. It's almost like saying you created the art and now the art is off on its own, giving off its own meanings, whether or not you even intended those meanings. Well, uh, I, I, I agree. I agree that everybody's free to add their own um, uh, story, narrative, uh, impression, um, and you can't deny it. And that's the problem with uh, um, 
art today that uh, not enough people get in front of it and are allowed to uh, uh, develop. I mean, you know, the, the, the big things today, um, and we're in a really odd uh, space that uh, um, more people are consuming uh, um, time using up uh, entertainment or uh, aesthetic, let's just say, it, call it aesthetic time, you know, and I think more people are using aesthetic time um, in things like uh, uh, Facebook and other things uh, along those lines, and it, it's sort of being, you know, robbing uh, um, real art making, unfortunately. Um, I think that's going to, I think that people are going to get tired of it eventually um, and swing to something else and you know, Facebook keeps getting um, novel and saying, well, now, and you know, Instagram said, oh, well, make, a, make your, your moments in life uh, artistic and aesthetically pleasing and, uh, you know, make it into a story. And Facebook now has stories and, uh, um, you know, but it still doesn't make my friends any more interesting than they already are, you know. And uh, um, I still think I have a great creative group of friends and, you know, some are, some aren't. I haven't really changed my opinion of, of people uh, based on how I see them uh, on Facebook. You know, I might be uh, surprised by a couple that they share as much as they do, but I still don't think any, any better or worse of them. What, um, do, what does the word friend, Facebook friend, mean? Because uh, it doesn't mean what you just said. You said, you know, I, I still appreciate my friends. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, I've got, I've got 2,300 links on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And they're not, you know, anywhere near all my friends. I'm a very uh, known person. I don't deny it. Uh, and uh, um, a lot of them are friends of friends. And I was nice to click yes. But there's also hundreds that asked to be my friend that I just don't even know who they are. And I don't, I don't uh, join. But... Uh, um, I think Facebook is this, just this broad uh, um, electronic community of connections, and some portion of it happen to be people you know in real life. Um, but let me, let me get back to this uh, notion of, of you um, as a creative person, um, and I'm getting this sense in our conversation that, um, and maybe it's, it's, it's been obvious all along, that you're really imbued with the people that you bring in here to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and did you start from a position that um, I'm going to make stuff and um, you chose to do this? Or was this always, I'm just going to um, open this up for everyone else? Uh, it's a, well, all, one of the uh, guiding principles in my life. All right. Uh, is altruism. And let, let me just explain that a little bit. I think that when I look at the world, I say, I would like a world that is based on altruism. Therefore, there's an expression, be the change that you want to see in the world. So therefore, I should be altruistic. And sometimes this blows people's minds because somebody came here once and asked if they could do a radio show. And, I, and they said, I explained to them everything that they have to do, et cetera. And then they said, how much does it cost? And I said, it doesn't cost anything. And they said, no, really, tell us, how much does it cost? And I said, it doesn't cost anything. And then they said, but then why are you doing it? Are you making money somehow off this? Like, they couldn't wrap their mind around it that unless there was a commercial value attached to it, there'd be no reason to do it. Um, in other words, we live in a society that I don't think they learned that at birth. I think it was taught to them being raised in the capitalist system that yeah, people are sure. by nature greedy, meaning they do everything for money. And I don't think that is necessarily the case. I don't know that it's anything modern, though, because we can trace back societies that have been conquering each other for uh, thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I don't know that... Uh, um, I think there's been pockets of societies that have been altruistic uh, to each other uh, for years, but there's also uh, surrounding them or around them have been um, pockets of uh, society that have been uh, um, conquerors and greed people. 
Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to capitalism. I think capitalism is the one of the uh, big prevailing uh, systems that we live within and mm -hmm. live under. Um, so uh, I, I often think the same thing that you're talking about, and I, I am fully on board with uh, being altruistic. I, I pretty much wake up every day saying, what can I do to help other people? Um, and uh, that's another concept. I often think that uh, saying no to someone is a great way to help them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and that's what a lot of people feel about, uh, you know, saying no is you're not being very helpful, you know, especially if you, to the person you're, that's asking for your help and say, well, I, I'm saying no because I'm really unable to do what you're asking, mm -hmm. you know, or I, I'm not, I don't have the time, I don't have the means, I don't have the knowledge. So it's, it's got to be no. In fact, it's better that it's no because if I say yes and help you and screw up, you'll be less happy with me than me just saying no right now and you going in. Me saying no means that you can immediately go to someone else and ask them hmm. that maybe has some more knowledge or uh, what have you. But uh, a lot of people don't think that uh, uh, no is a very altruistic answer. Here is an example of my life that, uh, a true story, and it will help answer your question about my motivation in art. All Perfect. Right? I'm in the vault at Hall Walls in the 1980s. And somebody comes up to me. It was uh, one of the people who worked there, but she's long gone and I don't even remember her name. And she said, oh, at the staff meeting today, we decided that a sandwich board sign that we would put on the sidewalk in front that we could put our flyers like underneath plexiglass or something and that we might get some traffic from people who walk by during the day and they see the sandwich board with the flyers there. Can you help uh, me build that? No, she said, can you build that for us? And I said, no, but I said, I can build it if you build it with me. And she said, and this was so telling, she said, well, if that was the case, I wouldn't have even asked you. <laughs> she said, I want someone who's willing to build it, and how much are they going to charge to build it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, that, that's not my, uh, my concept of doing art. Yeah, you have a different means of exchange. Well, you get inspired to do something, and then you do it with somebody together, and then you, bo you bond over the creation. So... Uh Let's keep digging here. Um, you know, so you you uh, went to altruism as a big motivator, as mm -hmm. a big uh, as a base mm -hmm. of uh, um, the years of making this. Um, and but you didn't really answer whether um, um, this was uh, uh, creative for you, or are you offering the um, opportunity to be creative for others, or is it both? Uh, I would say it's both. Yeah, it's creative for me, and it's an opportunity for others to express their creativity at the same time. It's. It, it, would you say, and we've <clears throat> known each other for years, would you say that, because uh, I, I started out making uh, performances and, and videos, but I bridged over and found much more enjoyment and pleasure in producing the artists and models is that something similar that, because uh, I found the artists and models as a creative engagement um, in that the the whole framing of it was something I had a hand in, but the content within it was always, and this is what we started the conversation with, mm -hmm. is that I didn't really tell people what to do <clears throat> unless I had a specific idea in mind and I knew that they would be a great person to do it and they could freely say yes or no. So. Mm. Is, is that something you feel connected to, that um, um, your creativity is the, uh, um, is the uh, opening of creativity to others? Yeah, that's, that's a very nice way of, of presenting it, sure, sure.